I'm going to talk about UL 4600 safety standard for automated vehicles and uh, the key ideas. So Deb did a great job of explaining all the various changes that went into the third edition, so I won't rehash all those. Instead, what I'm going to do is give an updated high-level overview that talks about the various pieces and uh, hit some of the, the bigger uh, technically heavyweight changes that made that, that change the, the character of the standard. There weren't huge changes for trucks. Uh, those actually turned out to be so, somewhat, um, they fit nicely into the framework. It was more of just elaboration about trucks. But there are a couple of things that, uh, that have changed that will make the standard stronger, I think. Okay, uh, so the overview will be talking about UL4600. Um, it's for automated driving. It covers SAE levels three through five. I've heard it incorrectly said that it only covers level four and five. That's not correct. It covers the automated driving phase of level three features. So when you are told that the car is driving and you do no longer have to pay attention to the road, UL4600 very definitely applies to, to that set of features inside a car. Uh, it was first published in 2020, but the third edition came out in 2023. So you can see there's a, a reasonable pace of updates. Uh, something that is was nice to see is that none of the updates have been a major change that, that uh, invalidates the rest of the standard and you have to start over. They've all been either clarifications or, or, or um, uh, improvements in separate areas that lay on top of the existing standard. So we've been very fortunate that it's not been a major upheaval, but rather a very smooth, uh, reasonable evolution. And, and I expect that will like that trajectory will likely continue. So getting involved with the second edition, the third edition didn't disrupt anything. And the second, if you get involved with the third edition, whatever the future holds for the fourth edition, uh, the the um, the drafting committee is very very mindful of not disrupting things unless there's absolutely no choice. I'll talk about the key ideas. Uh, the system level safety case provides direction. Uh, it talks about not only the vehicle, but also the infrastructure and life cycle. So it's more than just the driving box. It's about the entire vehicle has to be safe and the support. Uh, we talk about safety metrics. That's an area that got strengthened in the third edition in a good way, I think. Uh, we'll talk about third party component support. So the supply chain can still play a, a very active and useful role in UL4600 based safety cases. And the, the big thing is UL4600 helps you know you've done enough to work on safety. It does not say step one, step two, step three, here's how you build a safe self-driving car. That's not the standard. There are other standards that you can refer to the, for that. What this is doing instead is saying, look, you said you're safe. Uh, how do you know you're safe? Why do you believe you're safe? Where's the evidence? So it's a way to accumulate all the work products from the other standards and present them in a way that someone other than the designers can reasonably believe that, that yes, in fact, it's as safe as it needs to be. Uh, the third edition did include heavy trucks and improved SPI definition. Those are the, the big technical changes. There were a lot of um, editorial changes and adding examples, uh, as Deb said, for, for emergency responders and so on. That's all great stuff. Uh, it adds more detail. It certainly adds more things for, for teams to, to think about to make sure they get them right. But the things I will concentrate on, uh, the heavy trucks, basically it turned out heavy trucks fit right in. We just had to deal with uh, hazardous loads and a few other things. Uh, but the improved SPI definition, even though it was a small change in text, it has some important implications for, for how you can use this standard going forward. Okay, UL4600 is a goal-based approach. A traditional safety standard says, here's how to do safety. Okay, do a HERA, identify your safety concepts, and identify how you're doing risk uh, for 26262, for 21448. It's about the go out and find the triggering conditions and fix them. So it's a sort of cycle. And, and um, there's IEC 6158, MIL standard 882. All those standards are still there. They all have procedures and work products you're supposed to produce to do safety. UL4600 does not change or tell you not tell you to skip any of those. It does not replace those. But what it does do is it says, hey, why are you doing 26262? There's this part that's optional or they don't really talk about what to do. And we're going to fill in that blank because if it's an autonomous vehicle, you have to pay more attention than you might in a conventional vehicle. 
uh, to make sure things are right. So, so do 2662, but while you're doing it, make sure you also do this, or when you do a certain work product, make sure the work product has this thing in it, because you'll need that to, to satisfy UL 4600. So it lays on top of those standards. It does not replace them. Uh, and as far as, as we have um, the committee who, who uh, the contributors to the standard had a lot of involvement in those other standards, all of the ones listed. The, many of the committee members have been involved in all these standards. And the the one overarching rule was not, not to not break anything in the existing standards, and I think we did a good job at that. So UL 4600 is gold-based. It says, here's what a safety case should address. It doesn't say use this particular safety case. It doesn't say use this particular engineering approach. Rather, it says, okay, build us a safety case. Here's what it means to be a reasonable safety case but you can use whatever argument you want, but the argument has to cover the following topics because if it does not cover those topics, it's missing something important. So it's a way of knowing that your safety case is well-formed and it has everything in it without telling you a particular safety case and without requiring specific engineering processes in, in a direct way. Uh, there are a few things, you have to do hazard analysis. If you're not doing hazard analysis, you're not doing safety engineering. Okay, so somewhere in your safety case, where is the list of hazards? It's at that kind of level. Uh, and the standard itself is written as a way to assess the safety case. So it's not about build it this way, it's here's how you can tell a safety case makes sense. So it's an assessment-based standard, but to do that, it's very granular saying, here's all the things we're looking for in a good safety case, and the assessor should check to make sure they're there. Um, and so it's not, uh, it's not prescriptive in terms of engineering process. It does not give you the one true list of everything. It's a set of without these, your safety case is missing something. And of course, you will probably need to do more depending on your circumstance. So it's a minimum acceptable safety case. Uh, an example, so that if you look at this standard, it doesn't look like other standards. It's, uh, it's organized quite a bit differently than some of the other standards. Uh, in, in Deb and I both both sit on various standards committees, and this, as far as I know, this is the the one standard that looks this way. But it's it's because it's about making sure you didn't forget things, rather than telling you how to do the task. So the organization is different. There are a number of requirements, and it has the words "shall," so it's a requirement. Uh, but it's mostly not requirements; mostly other stuff that'll show up on the slide in a second. But there's a set of core requirements. Verification validations shall provide acceptable coverage of safety-related faults associated with the design phase. Okay, that's a pretty straightforward requirement. But when you read that, you say, well, what do they mean by safety-related faults? Is this the safety-related faults? And do I have to worry about this other thing? And, and um, what does acceptable coverage mean? So in order to interpret that requirement, we could have a big paragraph of text, but the text would never cover everything. And that would also have ambiguities. So instead of trying to nail it down to perfection, which you can't do anyway, what we did was it's mostly by example and by, hey, make sure you cover this angle and this angle and this angle. So each one of those requirements sentences in the standard has the following sections. So this is a template. All the requirements look like this, different content, but they all have a mandatory part. The mandatory part is uh, if you're building a safety case, you have to address these things. There's no way you could possibly have a reasonable safety case without addressing these. And so what do you mean by safety-related faults? Well, systematic design defects, that's one kind. Requirements gaps is another kind. Um, the mitigation of the aspects of the defined fault model and so on. So all these things have to show up in the safety case in the context of the requirement. So these are elaborations, sub-bullets underneath that requirement. There's also a required section. Now, mandatory and required sounds similar. There is a difference. The difference is mandatory, you have to have in the safety case, no matter what. You have to substantively address them. In required, you either substantively address them or you say this is intrinsically inapplicable. This simply does not apply to us. And most of the required ones, it's hard to think of an example, but there might be one. Someone in the committee was able to think of an example, however odd, that, yeah, maybe. And so in the safety case, you either say, here's how it's addressed, or you say, this one doesn't count because, uh, you know, and I'll make up a simple example, something about wheels. Well, our AV doesn't have wheels. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't apply to you, you don't have wheels. Uh, that, so that, that's kind of a made-up example, but it gives you an idea. It has to be really obvious, just does not apply. 
Um, so each each requirement is mandatory required. Most of them, this one doesn't, because so it fits on one slide. This one uh, doesn't have it, but many of them have highly recommended. And the difference between highly recommended and required is required is you have to do it unless it's impossible. Uh, highly recommended is we really want to see you do it, but if you have a good reason, you can document the reason why you didn't do it, and, and okay, you make the judgment. And so, so that's optional, but you have to have good accountability and traceability. And recommended is it's a nice idea, take it or leave it, it's up to you. Uh, and there's also a conformance section saying when you assess the safety case, you're going to look in this case at the design and the verification validation evidence and compare it against the safety case. So the the entire um, after the introductory few, couple chapters after about chapter four the entire rest of the standard all looks like this and and you can read it exactly that way they all required always means the same thing and so on so it's a, it's a couple hundred pages of things that look like this and there's a lot of stuff you have to do safety and if it's in the standard it's because the committee thought yeah you really need to do this you can't really afford to not do this and still have a safe AV. Now, it does give you flexibility. So um, let's take a different requirement. You can see that same structure. structure I, le I left out the, the recommended, but it's the same structure. Uh, and this is about hazard analysis. And it doesn't say you have to use ISO 26262 HERA. That's one of the options, but you don't have to use that one if you don't want to. What you have to do is have a hazard log that records criticality and initial risk. What do you mean by criticality? Well, it could be ASIL, it could be SIL, it could be DAL. We don't really care. There's a notion of criticality, and there's the initial risk, and you have to identify them, and we really want to see you use risk table, risk equation, bow tie diagram, pick one, but it's at least one. You don't have to use all of them. Pick whichever one makes sense, but these are all recognized um, approaches. There may be another approach that makes sense, so there's, a, there's an out there. We want, you to just, we want to see you do hazard analysis and write it down a log. That's really the requirement, and you have a lot of flexibility how you go about it. So the idea of a safety case-based approach is you can do anything reasonable, but you can't ignore things that are going to matter. Okay, that, that's the outcome. So it doesn't really tie your hands until you have to do it a certain way, but you can't ignore hazard analysis. If you're doing that, you're just not doing safety engineering. Okay, I mentioned safety case a few times. Let me make that a little bit more tangible. A safety case is, there's a definition in the standard, but basically it's a, it's a well-reasoned argument based on evidence that your system is as safe as it needs to be for your particular situation. Uh, and at the top, there's a claim. Now, this is claim argument evidence. If you want to use goal structuring notation, GSN, that's fine. The standard, again, says use one of these notations or, or another one that makes sense, but use a consistent notation. So we, the standard talks about claims, but GSN is perfectly fine. Uh, the claim is a property of a system, and there may be claims at the top, but then it works its way down to subclaims, and a subclaim may be the system avoids pedestrians. Well, why, how do you know it avoids pedestrians? You can't just say it and say, it avoids pedestrians, trust us, it's fine. I want to see some evidence, and probably that one's too complicated to have evidence for, so you probably want to break it down and make it so you can, you can understand it better. Maybe it's because we detect a maneuver to avoid pedestrians. Okay, fine and you may have tests and analysis and simulations, but you may also, you could stop there if you wanted to, but you could also, it may be convenient, especially if there's multiple teams, there's one a maneuvering team and a detection team, it may make sense to break it down to subclaims and sub arguments so each team can own their own piece of the uh, safety argument. And you may say, well, um, the argument for why we detect and maneuver to avoid is we detect and we maneuver around detected pedestrians, but if we can't maneuver, we stop. Uh, and then those are three different arguments and each one is supported by evidence. So you can make this safety case deep or you can make it shallow. If you make it shallow, it's going to be a lot harder to convince an independent assessor that you have everything covered. Uh, but at some point, you make it as deep as you think it needs to be. You provide evidence and you move on. Now, that doesn't sound like a, a, a fixed and concrete halting criteria. It's not. There's flexibility. But in case your um, argument turns out to be uh, a little bit too high level but a bit hand wavy, there's some instrumentation requirements to call you to account in case you wave your hands too much, which is going to be SPIs. We'll get to those in a minute. The scope of a UL4600 safety case is everything needed to independently assess safety. You need to have hazards and mitigation approaches. 
your claims have to be traced through from arguments to evidence. It includes technology. It includes life cycle. For example, after the vehicle, here this is not an autonomous vehicle. This is a conventional vehicle that had some sort of fire in it. Well, after there's been a crash or a fire, you want to make sure it's not going to take off and run over the emergency responders. Uh, and so you have to talk about things like this in your safety case. So it's not just about the automated driving system keeping you in the lane and not hitting things. It's about there's no driver in the car. The driver's not there. There's lots of stuff drivers do that isn't just steering the car. And your automated system has to handle all that stuff. Now, maybe there's remote assistance and you can say the remote assistance handle it. You know, that's all fine, but it's all got to be covered one way or another. There's infrastructure, what's your dependency on lane markings, and what assumptions are you making about uh, the infrastructure or the cloud computing or the HD map servers. Uh, there's other road users to consider. It reminds you, don't forget, in some places there's still horse-drawn carts and you don't want to spook the horses. There's all, uh, and scooters, and all this stuff is in there. A lot of it is, yeah, yeah, you thought of the common case, but you think of this, this, and this. And you could wait until you have a mishap or an incident in the real world, or you could just read the standard, and the standard tells you about it. You don't have to wait for it, something to happen because we already figured out this is a thing. You should deal with it. Uh, also talks about the operational design to me. Now, the ODD um, is, is a good example that, to show that this is a prompt-based approach. So it doesn't say, you shall do this, you shall do this, you shall do this. It says, you, should do, you, you, you shall do this thing, and then a bunch of, think about this, think about this, think about this, think about this. And so it may not say, you shall consider all relevant behavior roles. It'll just say, hey, behavior roles. Well, you know, we're all adults. We're all sophisticated engineers. If they say behavior roles in the context, if you have to think about the ODD, it's like, oh, yeah, I have to think about behavior roles. Then there's also non-normative examples, traffic laws and local customs and justifiable rule breaking. Those examples do not all have to appear in your safety case but they're there to remind you that the, these are things that might apply to you and you should include the things that apply to you. And an, an independent assessor can look and say, uh, you know, I see your safety case doesn't have justifiable rule breaking in the safety case, but looking at how your vehicle is going to operate, I know this is going to be a thing. Let's talk about why it's not there or, or maybe you should add it. There's compliance strategy of traffic rules and regulations, vulnerable populations, special road users, seasonal effects. And you can see, I, I put these in because these are more example, if these are definition by example rather than uh, a prescriptive, you have to address all these things. So the design team has a lot of flexibility in doing the right thing. And there's a lot of examples in the standard to make sure you understand what we meant when we said seasonal effects, but also to point out some of the things that, that are lessons learned somewhere in the industry that may not be obvious to a design team that just hasn't run into it. Uh, a, a thing that was in the original standard was safety performance indicators, but it's recently been strengthened in a way that I think that is going to really help. SPIs are like KPI. If you've heard key performance indicator, that's sort of a business management kind of thing. Well, uh, some companies have KPIs for the simulations, and it has to do with ride smoothness or deviation from the, the line you wanted to take through a corner, things like this. Those are all fine, but it's unclear how much they correlate to safety. If you care about a safety case, what you want are safety performance indicators, which are KPIs that are directly relevant to safety. And it provides metrics on safety case validity. Now, the first version was a little squishy on this on ten intentionally to give people time uh, to think about it to let the idea uh, mature, but it got stronger in the, the latest version. So the SPIs measure behavior metrics. For example, uh, how close are you coming to this to pedestrians? And it may be, in this case, a, a vision system did not see this pedestrian because it was confused by the light pole and, and, and uh, the strong vertical edges. Uh, but post-mission planning, anal post-mission analysis may realize, hey, we came a half meter from that pedestrian and making up a number here. Our, our standoff distance was one meter. We said if we're ever close than one meter to a pedestrian, that's unsafe. This time we're a half meter because we didn't see him. We need to go fix that, even though there was no incident, even though we didn't hit anyone, even though everything was fine, because this guy might have been waiting for the bus behind us. I think that's, I, I, I took this video, I think that's what was happening. But, uh, you know, he might change his mind and walk into the street, and you can't be passing 10 centimeters from pedestrian. That's just a really bad idea. Okay, uh, and the assumption validity within safety cases and other metrics. So 
the idea of an SPI was there's some number that measures safety, but the question has always been, how do you get the number? And I've seen far too many cases of people saying, here's something we can measure, so let's just say it's safety and move on so we have data. And, and there's no necessarily link between that thing and safety. You know, hard braking, people love hard braking for, um, for human drivers, and there's arguments why that somewhat correlates to safety. But for an automated vehicle, there may be no correlation. Who knows? Because hard braking isn't directly linked to safety, it's just a correlative association. So what you'd like is a metric that has a causal relationship with safety. And the third edition provides a more precise definition of SPIs that allows you to do that. It's basically a direct measurement of a claim failure. The, there's, there's fancier, more rigorous words in the standard, but it's a direct measurement of a claim failure. So the idea for, and this is highly recommended, so you, don't, you can do other things as well, but it's highly recommended. You should do this if you can. The idea is for every, or for every claim notionally, but probably for some set of sampling of claims. In the safety case, you say, hey, I made this claim. I claim that I would never I would never get too close to a pedestrian. I'd never violate a bio buffer zone. Uh, but, you know, maybe that claim's not true because of things I didn't think about. And so the an SPI is, well, you said you were never going to get too close to a pedestrian. You're saying that could never happen. And yet, here you are. It happened. Well, how are you going to know what happened? You're going to make, you're going to take a separate set of evidence, which is probably instrumentation in simulation, in road testing, and also in deployment that says, hey, uh, is my SPI false? Did I violate that claim? And uh, you're going to, when you say I was closer than I thought, it doesn't mean you hit someone. It means your safety case has some defect. You thought you were safe. Turns out you were wrong because one of the things you said was always true or statistically never, never violated more than uh, so often. It turns out it's violated more often than you thought. And so you're going to have to fix that. It might be a product process defect. It might be that your safety case left out, uh, oh, we didn't think about this. We didn't think about people who changed their behavior because they changed their mind, just to make an example. Uh, or there might be some bias or gaps in the supporting evidence. You have to figure it out and fix it. So the point of SPIs under this definition is there's a direct causally linked relationship between the measurement and the safety case. So you're not measuring the bad outcomes. You're not measuring crashes. You're not me measuring near misses necessarily, you're measuring your safety case said the following is almost always true. And guess what? It just got false a bunch of times. You better go fix that. Could be an assumption error. Could be anything. So this gives you, this lets you do feedback loops. So it used to be for design testing and deployment, you'd have design hazard analysis, ISO 26262. You'd have testing and that would find some triggering events, uh, ISO 21448. And for deployment, you'd have some runtime safety monitors uh, the, the like the red light on your dashboard in a conventional car, but in AVs you could say, hey, we're too close to that car. I'm going to put on the brakes to, to back me off because I know I'm too close. All those stay the same and those are fine. SPIs are not runtime safety monitors. They are not invoking a mechanism to bring the car to a stop. You can do that. You should do that. But SPIs are not that. SPIs are statistical measurements that are used to improve the safety case and likely improve the product as well. It's like, well, you know, we're getting a bunch of near misses, nothing bad happened, but we need to fix that before we get unlucky. So SPIs give you a life cycle way to manage and improve the uncertainty about safety in your in your system that, that stems from your safety case being incomplete or, or having missed things. Uh, it also covers elements out of contact, uh, context, I'll do this quickly, but in ISO 26262, there's an, a SEOC, so you can buy um, an ASIL certified operating system or an ASIL certified um, CPU and, and so on. And UL4600 is the same idea that you can have a safety case for some component, and it could be hardware, it could be software, it could be anything, it could be a data feed, uh, it could be a map, HD map, but you have some component and the vendor wants to keep their safety case proprietary, so they create a safety case, they get it independently assessed, and they give you an interface saying, we have a safety case, it's been assessed, uh, but the, the bottom line of the safety case is we promise to provide the following properties as long as you pro promise to honor the following assumptions in our safety case. Uh, so it's a contract-based uh, approach, contract-based interface. Uh, and so that's been in there since the first version so that you can have a system integrator with a safety case that's complete, 
by pointing to uh, an EOC interface that, that some vendor has said, Here, here's the thing, trust us, it's fine, we have independent confirmation, but here's what you need to complete your safety case. So you, that way you don't have to have all the details for every component in one massive safety case. Uh, it complements other standards, ISO 26262, MIL standard 82, and so on. I mentioned our potential starting points. Both of those standards have been used. You should use those standards. 21448 is, is fine. You should use all the standards you need to use because 4600 doesn't replace those. It tells you, it makes sure that you didn't skip steps that matter. There may be steps in those standards that are optional or that you can do the easy way or the more rigorous way. And 4600 says, here's how rigorous you probably want to be based on your safety case. You know, you're arguing this. You have to account for these things one way or another. But a lot of it is, did you think of that? It boils down to, so you did all these safety uh, processes, you followed all these standards, but did you think of this? And did you think of this? And did you think of this? Uh, in downtown Pittsburgh, a couple years ago, a bus fell into a hole in the middle of the road. It was a uh, it was actually um, a poorly supported place that had been repaired and it collapsed under the weight of the bus. And the bus driver knew, you know, maybe I should stop the bus and open the doors to let people out instead of just having the wheel spin. Uh, and if it was an automated bus, this is on the list of what about, uh, what about um, uh, subsidence? Uh, what about uh, pits? What do you do if you hit one of those? Uh, you know, it's not, it's not something you have to keep driving, but it's something you can't just do something crazy that puts people in danger because you didn't design for it. Some other key points. Uh, so heavy trucks are in there. It turned out to be adding a few examples, adding a few more, what about hazardous load placards and stuff like that. But, but uh, the framework actually worked quite well. It, it's the same standard for trucks as cars, just trucks have a few more things to think about. Uh, you can self-certify. There is some, uh, some folks who will say things that are, are not quite um, accurate about the standard, so I want to get some of the common inaccuracies settled. You, there is no requirement for an external certification. You, there are companies who will do external certification. That's great, but you are not required to use them by the standard. You can self-certify as long as your assessors are competent and independent of the design team. Uh, there are, it's only necessary technical mitigations are required. So people say, there's a lot of stuff we have to do. Well, no, you don't have to do the stuff that doesn't make sense. You just have to write down, no, nope, that one didn't make sense, that didn't make sense. Uh, and so it's not requiring activities that would not otherwise be required to be safe. The only things you need to do, the things you would have had to do to be safe in the first place. There's no extra stuff other than keeping track to make sure you didn't forget something. Uh, Underwriters Laboratories is a nonprofit standards development organization. Uh, and Deb covered that, so I'll move on. But I will mo note that this is under continuous maintenance, and so uh, anyone can submit a request for an improvement change addition at any time, and it'll get considered, and it turns around pretty quickly. Does it conflict with other standards? No, it doesn't. It, in fact, it's intentionally designed to be compatible with them. Uh, and Deb mentioned digital view. If you want to read the standard, you can read every single page of the standard in a web browser for free from UL, unlike the other standards which you have to buy to even see what's in them. You can see actually all their standards. You can take a look online, read the whole thing, see what's in it, and decide to buy a copy or not as, as makes sense for your situation. Some review of key ideas. It's a system level safety case that provides direction. It highlights gaps in evidence and arguments. Uh, it covers the vehicle and the parts of the infrastructure relevant for safety and life cycle. If you're doing real-time HD map updates, that entire life that entire system is safety critical because if they're wrong, you're going to have a problem. And so to the degree, the standard says, hey, did you think about HD maps being safety critical? And if they are, you have to put them in the standard. I mean, that's the way the standard works. There are metrics combined with feedback loops, so the SPIs have a, have a nice stronger way of giving you lifecycle feedback with the, with the new uh, approach. It gives you a third-party component interface, and it helps you know that you've done enough safety work. Lots of prompts and pitfalls, and one of the things we're really looking for is if people have things that have happened that are important, that are missing, put them in. Even if the contribution is, hey, you should add an example of a certain thing, that's great. I keep a list of those for the next version and so should everyone else. Send them in because the more examples we put in, the more the, the less chance that some design team will miss something and will have to have a mishap to learn the lesson that they could have learned from somebody else. 
Last page. Uh, I have a personal UL4600 launch page. This is not endorsed by ULSC or any other organization. It's my personal one. Uh, but it's um, bit.ly UL4600. It has pointed to other recorded talks. Um, it points to the where you can go for the standard. It has a couple short articles. There's a short article if you want to show your boss uh, something that is less than 300 pages long. So it's a, it's a starting point that may be there for you, you to use it. There's a guidebook. Again, this is not officially endorsed by anybody, but it's um, the st I went through the standard and tried to digest it to English prose instead of uh, checklists, uh, and some folks may find that helpful.